Let's do this. Welcome everybody to our 44th edition, number 44 of What Keeps You Up at Night, Entrepreneurship During Challenging Times. Hey, I got some people doing jazz hands back there and I, I had the dinner on gallery. There we go. Everybody's doing jazz hands today. Apparently that's a new thing. That's what we do here on the show. So my name is Colin West and I am the community leader for Startup Vancouver. Losing my voice here already. Must be the lack of cardio I'm getting here, uh, locking down at home. I got to get out and uh, maybe get some more steps in here. Deep breath. There we go. Improve my cardio. So Startup Vancouver is one of over 40 chapters of Startup Canada, as you can see with the sign behind me here. What we do and why we do it is to connect. As a volunteer-based group of entrepreneurs, we are here for entrepreneurs to connect them to events like this, resources, mentors, each other, both locally, regionally, nationally. And today we got Melanie Hugh and our good friend here from Volition, who's coming from the West Coast, another West Coast or West Coast of Ireland, apparently all over the world. This, this show is going global. That's what we can do when it's virtual. We're not just confined to a space here. So this is gonna be an amazing show today. Our good friend and co-host Reza V is a little bit late jumping on here, but we're gonna keep, uh, keep rolling along here until he does jump on, but until he does, I'm going to do my usual thing. I'm going to do a little, little intro here, community announcements, and let people know what's going on here. So today on show number 44, as I mentioned, we have three dynamic, diverse, and awesome guests, people that we know. I haven't met James yet, but we're going to get to know him a little bit by the end of the show. Good friend, Melanie Ewan, who's a managing partner at Volition Advisors, who, of course, we've worked with for years, co-presenting Pitch Night Vancouver, Canada. And now, of course, they've been doing it virtual for the last little while. So we're going to get all the updates on the good things that they're doing in that thought leadership space. Uh, and Boris, man, Boris may not remember this, but Boris and I met, actually, my wife introduced us, I believe, through Mark Bussey. I think we sat down in your office about, gosh, about six years ago. It seems like another world. You were doing something different. We were working on something different, but at that entrepreneurial way we do, it's never a straight line. We're kind of like this and here we are converging again and meeting today. And we're going to hear about all the awesome things that uh, Boris is working on as CEO and co-founder of Vision. And, uh, and then James Bassnett, also head of retail with Shape. We're going to learn about all the great things they are doing in the AR, VR space. Uh, we've been looking for a while to showcase some of the awesome players in the AR, VR space here in Vancouver. This is Vancouver, if you do not know, in the virtual reality, mixed reality, augmented reality space is a world leader. There's so much going on here today. I think we actually have Dan Berger also jumping on as an attendee. So obviously love to hear Dan's opinion also, but really looking forward to what James is gonna be offering here today. So start of Vancouver, if you're not plugged in with what we're doing yet, best place to uh, connect with us is on social media. We are very active there, whether it's on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, also our LinkedIn community page, where we not only uh, put all the things out there that we're doing event-wise and thought leadership-wise here, well, also with our friends Startup Canada, but with others, like our friends at Volition, with all the great things that they are doing, uh, pitch nights all over the world virtually now and beyond that. So also, our, uh, our YouTube channel, we got that up and running uh, since September here. We post every single one of these shows on there. So yeah, over 40. So we've had over 120 awesome guests. It's like the three we're going to have today. And as you can see, we actually broke that 100 subscriber barrier there last week. So we put it out there for people to do it. I know, Melanie, you did. You helped us push this over the, over the top there. So we're just going to keep on rolling. As you can see there in the bottom part of the screen there, I just posted the six awesome speakers that we had as part of our Can Startup Stories, Mental Health for Entrepreneurs speaker series that was so impactful that we had on January 27th. So rather than having to go back and listen to a, a two hour and 48 minute video, which uh, a lot of people aren't gonna do, we broke those down into TED-like talks there, each one of them, oh, including on the far left there with our good friend, Miriam Mobini, who ended her talk with a, Miriam, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get this wrong, whether we wanna call it a, a, a kind of a sonic meditation, is that fair? Is that good yeah. Enough? There Sounds we go. Good. Yeah, there you go. And bonus, we're going to do something different today. Miriam's going to end the show today with one of her sonic meditations. So as we bring the energy level up here today, she's going to bring it back down and end the show like that so that we can all go for a nice nap and just kind of chill out. Because as we talk about here, what keeps you up at night? 
you know, these are tough times, tumultuous times. Things are stressing us out. So Miriam's going to be here doing her bit to try to de-stress us a little bit today. We always make this an interactive and engaging hour of conversation. So after we finish up uh, with each guest, we do open it up to the audience. So if you're on Zoom with us today, please uh, post uh, any questions you have for our guests in chat there. Hey, if you're uh, not so shy, you want us to open up the mic or even open up your video, uh, love to have you on there too. Of course, we are streaming this at the same, uh, same time on Facebook. So if you're on there, just leave a comment also there and happy to read that question out for you there. So a lot of you know, our charity partner is jack.org. And if you don't know jack.org yet, they are Canada's only charity that across the entire entire country is an advocate and ambassador for youth mental health awareness and they do this at a grassroots level by engaging with youth and they become those ambassadors in schools in the community that uh, remove the stigma and uh, break the silence around mental health advocacy especially with young people so so far we've raised a thousand dollars we just broke the thousand dollar mark here through donations and we have two people that have made donations today. I'm not going to make a spoiler yet, uh, but as I do at the end of the show, if people donate, I sing my little shout out song. So that's happening. I'm going to do that just before, uh, before Miriam does her sonic meditation. I think if I sing after that, I think uh, I, I may freak people out. So, uh, so we'll do that first before Mary, Miriam ends the show today. So as I mentioned, uh, we're, uh, we were going to open the show here with Boris uh, to talk about all the great things they're doing with Fission. And this is not my world at all. So I am fascinated by this as far as learning about fast app publishing and all the things uh, he's been working on the last while and over 18 years in his career. Uh, I know that Reza was gonna jump on. He's not here quite yet. So if that's the case, uh, we're gonna flip this around and Melanie and I are gonna go first today. He's here, he's here. Oh, he's here. All right, Reza. All right, he is uh, here. Hi, I'm here. <laughs> Atta boy. Look I at wouldn't that. miss this. See, see, in a way, I was kind of, I was, I, I was buying time here. In a way, I was buying time. Well, we're going to stick the plan then, because Melanie and I are going to have a conversation in the middle. We're going to get a catch up on all the great things globally that uh, that our good friends at Volition Advisors are are doing, and uh, they are they're, they're freaking crushing it. They're uh, they, you, they have been like ahead of the curve, like pre-pandemic, you were already there with, with your vision and strategy of how you're going to roll this thing out. So I'm really intrigued and curious, Melanie, to hear about how uh, you've taken it to the next level here. And what that's, because you've got so many choices here, like a lot of entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. you have to focus. So I'm really, don't, don't spoil it yet. I'm really mm -hmm. curious to see mm -hmm. if, how you, uh, there we go. You're not even opening your mouth. You're like, mm -hmm. snip. <laughs> so I'm curious to hear about that. And, and to end the show today, uh, Miriam is going to have a conversation with James, all the good things that Shape is doing. As you can see straight there, you know, shaping 3D and e-commerce. So love to hear the convergence of what they are doing, because that's been one of the, in my mind, of a kind of an outsider looking in with VR and AR over the last five or six years is all this great technology. But where does it go? How do you monetize that? How do you create social impact with that? So can't wait to hear this conversation with Miriam and James here today. But before we do that, we're going to do a segment that this second week in a row we've done this. We're going to start to do this all the time. Is how do you express gratitude? And we're calling this Gratitude Day because our show is always on Tuesday. So with that, I am going to open it up to everybody here. And I'm going to ask everybody one at a time here. What are you grateful for? Even like a small little thing today. Or maybe it could be something overall in your life. So, hey, Melanie, I'm going to put you on the spot to open up here. Uh, give mm. us a little uh, gratitude nugget. What what uh, what are you thankful for uh, in your life right now? That's a really good question. I actually skipped this question in my journaling today, so <laughs> it's like you read my mind. Um, I'm today. I'm grateful for. Um, it actually snowed here today, uh, and I haven't seen snow in a long time, and it always brings me a little bit of joy um, and giddiness when I when I see joy when I see joy that as well but when I see snow um, and get out there and it was frosting all of the fields outside of our um, uh, beside my office here it's just like a whole bunch of fields so um, honestly like today whenever I needed to feel a little spark of joy there are also like other really great things happen today I have the benefit of it being 8 p.m but um, every time I look to the right here I saw this like dusting of of snow so um nature typically brings me joy so that's that was mine today nice nice thanks for that boris how about you 
What are you uh, I'm actually going to stick with the weather uh, theme. Uh, I felt really lucky, really, for the past year. I live in East Van, the north end of Commercial Drive. Um, and I've got Woodland Park at the end of my street. Um, and I can go there. Uh, sometimes there's seagulls hanging out there. Uh, today is a sunny day, so that'll be easier and be an uplift to the mood rather than trudging through the rain. But either way, I've, we've got these natural spaces that are right nearby. And I've got a, lots of uh, local businesses that are uh, safe for me to visit in, in different ways that have stuck around. So Timber Train Depot is on the other side of the park. Coho Commissary is on the other side of the park. If I feel like splurging the calorie count, I've got down low chicken uh, around the, uh, the corner that is, uh, I would say, uh, top three Vancouver uh, fried chicken and the only Nashville hot chicken uh, in Vancouver. So I thought I'd get a little promo in for, I love my neighborhood and I love it. We all love Vancouver when the sun is out, right? Uh, absolutely. So, hey, the are, does that mean they're a sponsor of the show? Are we all going to get free chicken sandwiches? Unless someone's vegan out there. If that's the case, I'll eat theirs too. I'll have two. So I'll, they, I'll uh, see what I can do. Yeah, their sandwiches are bomb. They are unbelievable. So good. Thanks, Boris, for that. James, how about you? Anything you you want to express? Some yeah, towards? you know what? I'm really grateful. I'm grateful for, uh, for Dan Berger for um, saying, hey, you should jump in here and, and talk with the crew about some of the great things. You know, Dan's an incredible community builder and, and connector. And I also want to thank uh, Miriam for doing uh, the same thing. You know, uh, when I first met her, she was uh, building a community and uh, introducing people to concepts about increasing wellness and optimizing mental health. Um, with the transformative tech community. And so, um, you know, endlessly grateful for people like you that are trying to make the world better for all of us. You know? So please keep doing what you're doing. And I really appreciate the time that you put in. Nice, nice, thanks appreciate for that. You. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if I may go uh, to follow up with that. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate you, of course. And I appreciate that Dan is here with us as well. Um, hi, Dan. And thanks for being here and thanks for, you know, nominating James to be here with us. I'm really grateful for that. I'm really grateful for, yeah, you're talking about building community. And actually this morning I had a really amazing experience on Clubhouse. Um, I might be talking about Clubhouse way too much, but I'm a bit, <laughs> but I'm, as you can see, I changed my name so you can find me on Clubhouse there too. Um, I'm a bit obsessed with it and it's actually, I can, is bringing me these moments of joy. And I was uh, in a group uh, talking about like tiny habits, behavior change and everything and the, with my professor and other colleagues. And that was really fun. Um, so yeah, and uh, just going around like asking everyone, what is like, what, what are the moments of joy that, you know, Clubhouse has brought you? Um, so I'm, t yeah, I guess I'm a bit like pro us right now and i also like really grateful for the sunshine i'm 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 in the, you know east van as well so i think we're at boris we're pretty close um and uh yeah you can see like the room is like brightening up and it's, it's looking good so um thank you so much for being here nice nice i know that boris is kind of biting his tongue up she we, we talked earlier about uh his thoughts on clubhouse so we're going to hold on to off of that next thing you know it'll be like uh 12.59 and we would have done no guest interviews here. So we'll hold off on that. So Reza B who hustled up to join the show here today, obviously you've had a busy morning. How about you, my friend? Uh, any, I did uh, have a busy morning. I was, I was rushing back to office to make it to the show. No, I'm not going to miss it. Um, I'm going to just follow up on Maya. Maya is not only you, everybody who's joining Clubhouse, they're going to get this, this feeling because I love it too. I, it's been only four or five days. I've made new connections. I had amazing talks on there and I'm grateful for those. Um, and uh, I want to make a comment about like uh, the positioning, Reza's positioning, the rule of third. You're like you got it down. I love that you're like one third of the. I'm frame. blending with my background. That's my only mistake. I forgot <laughs> to not wear this sweater. Yeah, yeah. There we go. It's like all I see is <laughs> But a yes, I'm. <laughs> you can make it yellow, just like your pro fit your profile photo as well. That's your signature, right? <laughs> but I love the positioning. It works really well. Is that is that the, your new sound baffling uh, background there, Reza? That is the acoustic panel. We have uh, high ceilings here, so this is helping. You remember the first day I came here was echoing, so this yep. is helping. You're going all pro. We have to talk later about that, so I can do the same. So hey, I'm going to keep it nice and simple of what I'm you know grateful for today, and it's as simple as this. It, 
a memory that takes back to my family. Family, we went to Vietnam for a month when our kids were younger. So this is like almost 10 years ago, like I said, back in 2012. And we just went, planned it out and just kind of, it was an amazing trip. And one thing I loved, especially in the, the uh, Southern part of the, the kind of the French influence part of Vietnam, the coffee is amazing. And I absolutely loved it. And my wife actually bought, found it online, actually this instant coffee for the, this Vietnamese coffee that uh, is unbelievable. And I had one this morning and it just took me back it's kind of like ratatouille, you know, with the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the critic there putting the first mouthful of a ratatouille in his mouth there and, uh, of course, took him back to his childhood. So that took me right back there. So I was just grateful for that cup of coffee, just reminded me of that amazing month-long trip with my family there that still we talk about to this day. So uh, it's as simple as that. I'm, I'm expressing gratitude for a good cup of coffee today. So with that, let's get things rolling here. So uh, we're gonna open the show now that Reza hustled to get over here. So Reza, take it away, my friend, and you and Boris, looking forward to this conversation. So uh, so go for it, guys. Hi, Boris. I see, I see you're putting your name, ask me about open source clubhouse. <laughs> That's very cool. Um, Boris, I, I just uh, briefly went through your LinkedIn. I, I wanna know, I have a million questions. So let's dive into, First of all, am I pronouncing your company right? Is it Fission? Is that the uh, correct it way? It absolutely is. Yes. Fission. Awesome. <laughs> Boris is the co-founder and CEO of Fission. It's a decentralized tools for backend developers or, or, or um, how would you backend ex developer experience. Um, I want to know how you decentralize a backend. How does, how does that even work? How did you get into this business? Sure. Tell us your story. Sure. Um, so I'm actually going to go way back to uh, coming back to the Vancouver tech community. So um, back in the day, at the beginning of a lot of these things, um, Vancouver was a sleepy little town and everything was happening in Ottawa with Nortel. Uh, I graduated with a comp sci degree and uh, got hired out of school to, to move to Ottawa. Uh, Nortel was hiring 80% of new grads still at that, that time. So this is the web 1.0. Um, so I went through the, this part of the web 1.0 and then this part. And since Ottawa is uh, plus 40 in the summer and minus 40 in the winter, uh, I really wanted to come back to the coast. Um, I would gotten very interested in the very early days of blogging. I'm probably one of the first thousand bloggers in the world and I've been doing it since 2000. Um, and so my first company was actually about uh, building those first blog publishing platforms. Um, so we work with an open source CMS called Drupal. Um, WordPress launched slightly later than we did. This is pre-Facebook, this is pre-Amazon Web Services. Uh, we launched a hosted open source service with a SaaS business model in 2005, uh, which is about a year and a half before uh, Amazon Web Services existed with their first S3 services. Uh, I'm gonna skip everything in between and say, um, what if we could make app publishing as easy as making a blog post? And I think that's where we need to get to. Um, um, and that comes from my experience of, of basically saying, you know, even today, if we look at um, uh, areas of the world um, like Vietnam or India or Africa, uh, they, a lot of developers there can't access cloud services like Amazon or Google because they don't have a credit card. Um, so a lot of the things that we take for granted here are not available. So that just leads with my passion around open source making these things much, much easier, saying that the software revolution is just getting started. And so we have to make these things easier. Um, and uh, just like we've made lots of other things easier. So question around the decentralized part of it. What about the data privacy? What about the control? Who can yeah. access all that stuff? It, how, it's a really great question. Uh, you know, and the uh, uh, clearly I need to tune what it actually says on my uh, uh, LinkedIn that I, I, I'm not good at, at editing in all of those places. So decentralization just really means that you're not using one, for starters, for me, one central provider. So, and that actually even just starts with apps. If you sign up for um, a mobile app, uh, an invisible mobile app, uh, or an app on the web right now, most people are just starting to ask questions like, well, where is the developer keeping that data? Are they keeping my data encrypted? Is that data encrypted in such a way that the developer can't look at it? All of those things are really hard problems. So um, Fission actually spent a year building the technical building blocks around this. 
And we built a decentralized account system and we built a decentralized encrypted file system where every user's data is encrypted and private, um, um, backed up by us, although they can, they can store it themselves as well. We can't access it. So one of the challenges we have to have is actually have a way to recover data. It's a little like an open source iCloud. And that's a really useful building block for developers. They get an account login, they get file storage, they get a database, all while protecting user privacy and security as the day one experience of building an app. So may I ask a question as a non-technical person or non-technical founder, I want to simplify this. Yep. So for example, we have our data on, on a web server similar to AWS. Uh, and the way it's stored, people's passwords are, are encrypted. So we can't even know their passwords, only they can, you know, um, it's a one-way hash, right? So uh, yeah. we can see the data, but we can't see the password. You're saying we'll go one step further. We uh, host the data itself in another or decentralized places, similar to the way that we do a one-way hash on the password. We just do it with the entire data. So when it retrieves, I as the owner or I as the- As the user who's logged founder, into the app can can only see it is that Correct. is that how it works got it yeah exactly so and we also got rid of passwords while we were at it um uh so um this is possible because there's been some advances in uh cryptography things that are built into browsers so is it with um, ssh keys or, or is it beyond that uh it's beyond that there's uh basically the web browsers can now actually hold keys on your behalf again think of it like yes. apple we don't really think about it yes. but there's keys on here and you know if you log into your mac or your or your iphone it might say hey you're on a new device and we do the same yes. thing to link devices without having to to use passwords yes got it got it that's very interesting. And then what about the, so this is open source decentralized. What about the business owner? Can they see the data or only the end user can see their data? So, so right now the type of apps that we're uh, focused on initially, we need to add some more features to, to yes. support different kinds of apps are much like the things that you might have on your phone, right? Used okay. by an individual. So I had a really interesting discussion about someone who wanted to do um, a tracking about women's health data uh, related to menopause. Mm -hmm. Do you want to put it into a random app that might possibly be putting it somewhere? Um, so the design of these things become very, very hard. Uh, and we're saying that should be the starting point, right? Um, and, and obviously someone has to, has to understand and trust that we built it in this way, um, that, that at, for, for, for starters, much like on your phone, the app asks the user for permission to write into their file system. Um, and so the app actually runs on the user device and only the user can access their data. The app developer cannot actually access it at all. Mm -hmm. Got it. That's very interesting. And I think that's, that's uh, certainly the future because there's a lot of sensitivity about privacy. And I like it a lot because I'm, I'm relating it to, to where my startup is right now. And the way it works, as I told you, the password is hashed, so I can't see it, but everything else, the users are, are trusting that the privacy policy we have in terms of agreement, they're trusting us. And there's a legal document that says, this is what we do with your data. This is what we don't. Um, and and if you get trusting hacked, it. all the data is in the clear. So you can do as good a job as you can. Literally our stuff is unhackable. Um, whereas, whereas your system says, uh, I'm the, uh, I'm decentralizing this. You can, uh, the, the system works and, and the apps work. There's no, uh, dysfunction, but the data is selectively given to the developer for whatever purpose that that serves. And then it keeps it uh, decentralized. Is it similar to blockchain in a way when it's decentralized or there is no blockchain involved? Uh, no, we, we sit on top of a system called the interplanetary file system. Um, and at this level, a lot of people like to talk about the tech, but honestly, it's like talking about what database your app uses, you know, are you using Postgres or using MySQL. Those are the names of two databases. Got it, got it. Yeah. No one cares. Uh, so we're leaning into that and we work closely with that community and it's, uh, um, but we use it because it's a component that meets these other higher level goals that we've built on top. I have a two level question, Boris. Um, this is fascinating by the way. Um, going forward for this to become mainstream and all the apps and developers start uh, using it. Um, 
what what needs to happen and secondly today who is the target market for fission are you trying to raise awareness are you trying to get developers more excited about it or founders to start you implementing it and because i see a marketing aspect too like yes. we are using fission and this is the being proudly um you know showing it off yeah yeah so we, we're diving straight into some of the like like um things that fission stands for that 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 are not just the technology so that's that's definitely a thing right um i mentioned healthcare uh you know these are the types of things that we need to get to so there's a raised awareness there's a zeitgeist essentially of like right we care more about these things mm -hmm. broadly speaking both developers and users however it's if it's hard or different than what they're used to don't care won't pay for it <laughs> Um, so what I am saying is that if you are a front end developer, uh, and you want to bring a full app to market right now, you have to learn how to become a full stack developer. You have to figure out databases and you have to figure out hosting and you have to, and probably you're not going to get around to learning about encryption and security. Cause that's a whole other level that, that experienced full stack developers have, have trouble with. So what we're saying is that you should build whole host and eventually sell your app on Fission. So just like um, an e-commerce site used to cost $50,000 to build, and it's now $30 a month from Shopify. If you go to someone and say, I have an idea for an app, and this is every human who has a mobile phone has ideas for apps, right? Right now, and, and they say, I have $10,000. The developer says, I, I literally can't build you an app for that much money. So um, we want to enable also the creator economy of individual developers building apps, uh, open source developers who care about that, making it easy for their users uh, to run the app as well as know that it's secure and not some other platform, um, and design agencies who might punch out, you know, 10 Shopify apps. Each one of those ones, they have to click a button and configure in a GUI. You know, you've heard of, of low code or no code. We're proudly yes code. You are going to have to learn it, but you can implement encrypted logins, passwordless accounts, um, file storage, encryption, and sync between devices in about 80 lines of code. So compared to using a Firebase uh, from Google or an AWS Amplify, there's much less to learn. And we think we can empower many, many front-end developers. And above that, things like you know, if you're a designer, can I help you make an app? And instead of just selling a theme, you're selling an entire app. Um, so instead of selling a, a theme for $30, you're selling a restaurant app for $200. And with Fission, wow. I've given you a micro SaaS business, right? Nice. That's, that's some of the, the pieces Amazing. I tried to fit into the vision. I that's perfect. Uh, I have a million questions, but I've got to slowly wrap it up. The only comment I have here is that I love the practicality uh, of how you are approaching it and, and how Fission um, is, is making it easy for front-end developers. I also think that the markets like healthcare you mentioned and the ones that uh, serve enterprise, the ones that have sensitive customers around data privacy, this is a great way to, to market COVID and contact and tracing advantage and, and get advantage over, uh, over competitors. Amazing stuff. Thank you, Boris. Uh, I'm going to hand it to Mariam and uh, Colin for questions in the comments. I have, uh, yeah, just, uh, I'm wondering, Boris, uh, if you know about, for example, probably aware of the, you said you're different from the no code. Uh, companies, I'm just wondering when it comes to like Glide or Adalo or companies like that, how are you guys different? What's the so, difference? Yeah, so first of all, um, we're literally not no code. We're, we're aimed for developers. We have some features coming that are going to be around app cloning. So once a developer builds an app, let's say a restaurant app, and a designer says, I want to have a new theme or I want to add a feature, we're going to actually have cloning built in so that you don't have to go all the way to GitHub and learning how to code. So that's on us to keep adding to the platform, but it's a full app. So you can program anything where those no code platforms are limited to what's possible on platform and they're kind of locked in their world. I think that's kind of nice. So would it be that the cloning would actually enable the, the designers, let's say, um, to be able to move around these patches and everything and to create the interface and then, um, I, I mean, 
let's say it, yeah so coding. so it, what's what's interesting of course is that the thing that end users that people value is the mm -hmm. front end interface yeah. you know what takes most of the time today the back end yeah. uh so we see more iterations making this easier and, and so on and that gets to the, the the same goal that a lot of the no code folks put together very cool okay so there's a question um michael is asking what language are you using for coding great question uh so we run a bunch of back-end software so that we can make it easy for front-end developers but all of the interface on the front end is all javascript so when we say JavaScript, there's lots of different frameworks and people can bring their own framework. So React, Vue.js, Svelte, uh, lots of different systems like this that run just in the browser. Um, the other thing that's coming is something called WebAssembly where you can use any programming language um, and compile it down so it executes in the browser. So that's other future stuff that we're heading to as well. And on the back end, our two main languages are Haskell uh, and Elm. Elm is also a front end JavaScript language. Yeah, very cool. And um, Melanie is, uh, Melanie, do you want to ask your question yourself? Um, I think the board has kind of touched on it already around what is the vision for Fission, um, unless you had anything that you wanted to elaborate on, um, on that. Yeah, so basically 18 years ago, I helped make blog posting much easier with hosted mm -hmm. services. And I want to do the same thing with apps but bake in things like user privacy and a few other things that I think are very important. I think one that I didn't really touch on is I would like to enable um, digital makers to earn a living. So another mission that we're on is normalizing, wait for it, paying for apps. So if you have a developer who sells um, uh, 500 licenses at, at $50, they're making a living of $25,000 a year. How many areas of the world would that be an amazing salary? Right? That's what I'm heading towards. The answer is lots. What I love there is, is Boris, I, I've had the, the pleasure of knowing, knowing you over the last couple of years and you always have a why, right? You're not just building stuff. I hate that term serial entrepreneur. It's some, someone that's always kind of looking around for the next thing or something doesn't work out and because I will have abandoned that. You, you have your, your kind of your core values and your vision and you just very clearly articulated what it is here that the, and why you're doing that. So, uh, so that I'm glad you shared that because so many entrepreneurs, we talk about it all the time, but established entrepreneurs like yourself that are in early growth phase uh, often aren't, aren't actually then walking that walk and you're, you're actually down that road rather than this is what I'd like to do you're actually doing it. So thank you so much for sharing that with us here today. No problem. Thank you for having me. I just wanted to say like, I screwed it up the first time with how we built it. So I'm back at it. Nice. <laughs> right. Well, how, how entrepreneurial of you. So right. I know also in chat, we maybe want to look in there, Boris, if any of the uh, uh, tools that you are actually using uh, for coding, you want to put it in there to help Michael out or anybody else. Yeah, keep that conversation while we're going on. While... I jump on my conversation with the fabulous Melanie Ewan now. So Melanie, welcome. Good to see you, my friend. Hi, <laughs> it's great to be here. And so good to see you, even though not in person. Although, okay, now we're gonna spoil it. You've been out of the country for a couple of years now. Perhaps people that don't know you or don't know Volition and all the awesome work that you do and also with your good friend in Vancouver. People that don't know me? <laughs> I, there are, there's at least three in Vancouver that don't know you I think, uh, so far. So we're gonna, we're gonna clear that up today because I think all three of those people are on this particular uh, <laughs> attending today. So now everybody will know you. So give, give a quick background to, uh, to Volition, where you were a couple of years ago and then <laughs> kind of in, in the <clears throat> journey of Spain, Ireland, and then back again. Just, so start, start with Just uh, ease into my entire life story for the past right, five right. years. You've got 30, 38 <laughs> seconds. Well, why don't you start with uh, the formation of Volition back in the day, and uh, let's start with the origin story first for Volition. Sure, sure. Happy to. So I actually came from working in the federal government for 10 years, and the last five years of that disliked most of my my life during that time and realized that I really wanted to work with people. And I was always doing lots of different, um, I was always working on lots of different projects, doing lots of volunteer work. At one point in time, I had like 10 jobs going on at the same time. Um, and then when I met Paul Broussard, who's my business partner at Volition, 
um, and I heard about this concept called entrepreneurship, I was like, hey, that sounds interesting. So we sat down for a conversation. And I was like, tell me about this thing called entrepreneur. And he's like, uh, okay, well, like, where do you want to start? I'm like, no, no, I've like never heard this word. Like, can we just talk about this as a concept? I've always worked with nonprofits and government and academia up until that point. So I realized that um, these were my people and these were people who excited me and working with entrepreneurs, early to growth stage, any age kind of, actually I really love working with youth entrepreneurs in particular, but really any stage and age and all the things. Um, I love hearing these stories and I love hearing like Boris talking about where he started and like what got him like fired up and what he's fired up about today. Like that's something that um, I'm super grateful for today that I still get to work with people like, like Boris and like other people here who are here today. So um, what happened was that it took about six months of courting for me to leave the government because it was still a little bit scary to do so um, and jump into startup world. And that was ooh, 2015. Um, so I got into the startup world around then. And at that time we were actually called Elevator or Elevator Ventures. I don't even remember what we were kind of going back and forth between the two and figuring out who we were. Um, and we were doing consulting and, and fairly quickly learned we did not like to do that. <laughs> And we didn't like to help people build their websites and such. Um, we could do it, but it didn't get us up in the morning. So um, we evolved over time. And in 2017, uh, I guess, in 2017, um, Paul and myself and one and uh, a third co-founder that we had at the time, we decided to launch Volition, which was going to be focused on... At, at that time, it was really focused on building this advisory firm to support um, entrepreneurs. And we just really, we loved teaching. We loved working with these entrepreneurs one-on-one -on -one, as well as um, bringing in all these different advisors to, to help them through whatever their knowledge gaps or pain points were at the time. And we had um, 12 advisors who all specialized in something different from like marketing to, um, to sales, to pitch coaching, to HR, whatever it happened to be. Um, love, love, love this team. We loved what we were building. Um, and it was kind of interesting because we were like, this is something that, that gets us up in the morning. We want to work with these entrepreneurs. And everyone was saying, there's no way to make a, make a living working with entrepreneurs. You're never going to make money, especially early stage, because we were really well known for our pitch events at the time, which we've now done 101 of. Um, and they were really working with these early stage entrepreneurs. I'm like, yeah, we get that, but we love it. Um, okay, we, like, we think we can do this. We think we can do this. Like, as I think I can, I think I can kind of mentality. Let's keep switching things up until we can find something that works. And actually COVID, um, I know I just switched and didn't, I haven't gone into my journey of going to Madrid, good. but All we'll good. go back there. We yeah, we'll go back. Um, so it was when COVID hit that I'd actually been wanting to go virtual for a very long time. Um, I'd done a, a cross country research tour with my nonprofit in 2017 and met all these incredible rural entrepreneurs. And I was like, I really wanna bridge these geographic um, barriers that we have um, and I want to learn more about all of these incredible entrepreneurs around the world. I think we should be virtual. Um, so when COVID hit and why per people were like perceived that we just like switched on a dime is because I've already been like incubating that thought for two years. And I was like, we're doing this. This is our, like, this is our moment to try this out. And, and I've been, I've been managing events for like 15 years. So it wasn't like, it was just, I don't know, applying applying things in different ways. And we'd already been doing some virtual master classes and all these things. So switched to uh, virtual. And we also, um, as for many other people realized in that moment in time, that whole concept of you're never going to make money from entrepreneurs was even more exaggerated in that moment. So we're like, you know what, that's fine. Let's support our entrepreneurs. Let's go talk to our partners. Um, and let's go lean into that network and, and, and see how we can support our partners. Um, which we absolutely love doing. And after the, uh, over the months, um, between, I guess, March and now, we pivoted because um, we found that that was actually a space that we not only loved, but a space that made sense for us. And that like all the work we've done in building our brand over the last X amount of years really helped position us as a trusted partner in not only Canada, but the US and Europe. So um, ended up building this incredible, um, uh, we have built this incredible network of partners and now we're working with them and delivering partner programs. We're still delivering coaching and community events, but we're more focused on that, that um, working with trusted partners. And we like our vision, we sat down recently and we're like, you know what, we got to go back to our vision now that 2020 is over and we're 
not quite sleeping yet, but it's, you know, a little bit better. Um, and we sat down and we're like, you know what, we like, we really believe that startup ecosystems are made stronger and more sustainable when the actors within them find meaningful and creative ways to, uh, to collaborate together. And not just like in a nice way to say that, but we, that's something we really believe at our core as humans at, on our team. And then we've just been finding ways to make that work as a business right, as well. Right. So it's been incredibly transformative after, over the last few months and um, has been a lot of fun. So that's kind of what the evolution of Volition has looked like. And we actually are gonna have a new website and we have new branding um, because we also found our tone in branding was not matching who we were. Uh, people will be like, you feel very corporate, but then I meet you when you are like not corporate. You have purple hair, which is not super in today, but typically purple hair and a nose ring and like super, super friendly and everyone at Volition super friendly. I uh, hope you can attest to Colin. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> we're like, okay, we got to switch this up. So that's the volition story anyways. Nice, nice. And, and what, what I love, you, you using words like collaboration and partnerships. And, and I've seen you and Paul and what you've done and how you've evolved and transformed and grown over the last five years. And I was there when you were at this kind of this identity place. You know, <laughs> what are we and what, what are we doing? <laughs> With yes. elevator and then the aha moment with volition and then encapsulating that and so for all entrepreneurs out there that are thinking oh do i have to create a product is it all tech here's a great example even though you're there for entrepreneurs as part of that innovation ecosystem support that you every day you wake up as entrepreneurs to find ways to unlock new value for, mm -hmm. for clients and, and, and customers. So I want to ask you this, as you've evolved and, and had those insights, because you ask lots of questions and you reach out with your partnerships now globally, yeah. uh, who, who are your main customers now? Who, who pays the bills at Volition? What are you finding it's a, is where you're adding the most value? Is it more of a, a kind of a B2B type of a play or yes. perhaps you can elaborate, yeah. elaborate on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we get asked this a lot, actually. And um, yeah, so we were B2C previously. We were doing most of our work through uh, the one-on-one -on -one or one-to-many kind of uh, coaching, and now it's B2B. So we work with um, different groups. So whether it's a, um, a group like Startup Canada, for instance, who we are proud and trusted partners of, and we're putting on masterminds and masterclasses and creating co-creating content and all these kinds of things, or if it's an accelerator, or if it's like a, um, a group um, that organizes other groups, um, I just call it like Startup Canada as well. Um, we work with um, schools who have entrepreneurship programs. Um, we work with some angel investing groups who um, are looking for support on deal flow uh, or looking to for support on um, uh, kind of managing the influx of people coming in and helping them prepare their pitch, for instance. Um, something I do want to note is that we're very well known for pitching, but that's for 2021. One of our big aims is to broaden that scope and ensure that people realize that we're not just pitching. We have incredible, incredible experts in that like sales and, um, and marketing space and customer success and HR. And we're just starting to unlock that. And I'm really excited to showcase all of that incredible knowledge. It's amazing. Um, yeah, so we work with all different kinds of people and it is the, through the partner programs, we have like, I think we're developing 16 proposals right now. It's insane. Like the need is there. Um, we work with uh, government, we work with we, consortiums, um, kind of all different. It's honestly, the, it's, it's exciting once you start thinking like that because or thinking like beyond or just like what is possible, what is possible. And if you see this like woman in STEM strategy, uh, the Canadian women's STEM strategy, if you see these like massive strategies that these, these um, governments are implementing around the world, uh, like where is that money trickling down to? But those people aren't subject matter experts. So they're looking for people to come in who have specialist expertise to then support their entrepreneurs or even like a train, we're doing a train the advisor program proposal right now. We're gonna start training advisors who work with women entrepreneurs in particular. So um, yeah, the, it, that's who pays our bills right now. And um, I am happy because then we can provide for free um, or very low cost our services and um, programs to the entrepreneurs that we always wanted to bring that value to to begin with. Right, right, nice. No, I, I love this of how you've actually unlocked that value. And that took some time, right? You yep. trial and error, <laughs> A-B test to kind of see what oh, yes. works as entrepreneurs is like- oh, yeah, and those- it, Get rid of that. And like the moments that you're like, okay, six months from now, if this X, Y, and Z hasn't happened, we're going to rethink our strategy. Like, like, should we even be doing this? Like we've had those conversations of like, 
do we fold? Like, is this it? Um, yeah. And just never gave up. We were just like, no, I, I just don't want to. There has to be something here. Love it, love it. I, I know we've, we've got to keep moving here with, with time here. I do want to ask you one question because you are in Ireland right now. So <laughs> as quick as you can, this is a couple of years ago, you just got married to your wonderful <laughs> husband. And uh, you tell your business partner as things are starting to chug along with volition, oh, by the way, I'm moving to Spain. So uh, yeah. <laughs> that was probably an awkward conversation, probably a little tension, yeah. but, but you were almost you know, on the curve now working virtually or, or totally anywhere. Virtually. So tell us about, about your decision to take that literal mm -hmm. across the ocean. There. Mm -hmm. um, that was actually in response to some pretty severe burnout that I went through in 2017 and throughout the first half of 2018. Well, actually, I guess all of 2018. I'd done a, a pretty extensive research tour um, with Women in Tech World, it's a great organization. I still work with them and do research with them um, as their lead researcher and facilitator. But at the time we did a three and a half month tour across Canada and it was like 20 hours a day. And, um, and it was about the barriers that women experience in tech. And that was a really difficult conversation to facilitate day after day after day. So got home because it was quite burned out, didn't, con didn't continue to take care of myself because I was um, taking care of all the data and turning it into a report, which took like, eight months. Um, so, it was it was a conversation where um, my husband he works in visual effects so he can work anywhere that there is a studio um, and he'd been being courted by this um, studio in in Spain for a while so we were like you know what we sat down one day you know what let's a get married because um, that'll make things easier and because we love each other and all those spooky things but we're like that'll make life easier <laughs> um, <laughs> and so we're like let's do that first and then um, within like four months uh, and then let's go to Ireland, or not to Ireland, let's go to Madrid, because I, I felt at that point in time that I was in such a, like my health had taken such a drastic hit physically and mentally and emotionally that I needed a, a very different experience around me. I needed to get away from the things I was constantly saying yes to. I needed to be somewhere where their pace of life is just naturally so much slower. So I didn't speak Spanish, neither of us did. Um, so that was interesting, um, but I loved it. Moved there in 2018. We stayed there for two and a bit years, I think, two and a bit years. We were there until this past August. Unfortunately, we were there during their really intense lockdown, which was a whole other level of traumatizing. Um, and then we ended up leaving that um, because because uh, Tom got a, a job here in Ireland, but also because um, it was very difficult. It was very, very difficult in lockdown there. So um, like all jokes aside, it was very hard. And I went back to therapy and things like this. So yeah. we needed to get into nature. We needed to, again, get ourselves into a different situation um, to get back into some some habits that were rejuvenating. So, um, and so it's been an incredible, you know, two and a half years, as I mentioned, I'm coming back to Canada in just a few weeks, um, which is also stressful, but <laughs> right now, but um, it's been such an incredible time. And we, we got to, with Volition and with Women in Tech World, um, we got to expand our network so much. And 2019 was all about building this network, going to all the conferences, talking to all these amazing people, um, learning you know what other countries and ecosystems are doing which was amazing um and i don't know where the next you know we're going to montreal next but we don't know what comes after that and when you say like with paul and with ali close at women tech world they were amazing when i said i'm going paul was just like he's like i kind of like expect you to shake things up once in a while that's just how i do and he was like he's like he's like you know what every time you decide to do something that seems outlandish it always ends up better for the company so you do you. Nice. So he was actually incredible. Put it out there to the universe and good things happen. So I know we got some questions, but we are running a little bit late. So we're going to leave it at that. And we're going to have to have you back on the show in another year or so. And you can tell us what's going on in beautiful Montreal and you can go, go yeah. from there. So I know <laughs> well, that Miriam uh, and James are going to jump on and then Miriam's going to end the show so that I keep that uninterrupted. I'm going to switch it up a little bit here. I'm going to do my little musical gratitude shout out right now and then Miriam I'm going to hand it over to you and James and then Miriam for you to finish up the show all in one one fell swoop here so with that as I said very very thankful for two donations to jack.org today and those donations came from two of our fabulous guests today and as most of you know, and definitely Miriam and Reza, they're probably tired of this already. Maybe they're not, who knows? But I do something that goes like this as a way to show some gratitude on behalf of jack.org. <clears throat> nice donations by you, jack.org says, thank you. 
You are awesome, Melody Ewan and Boris Mann. Uh, nice donations. Bye. You. There we go. There we go. That just happened. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I've been looking forward to uh, talking to James and James wears a lot of hats. Um, he's here representing Shape, but he's also the founder and VP um, of business development for his company, Answer Intelligence, which is a consultancy agency. And also, you know, we came to know each other two years ago through an email, right, introduction. Um, he's also on a committee member at the Toronto chapter of Transformative Technology. Um, and of course you wear a lot of hats and, uh, but I wanted to talk to you um, today about obviously SHAPE, your involvement with SHAPE and what you do there and the exciting project that you guys have been working on with the Vancouver Mural Festival and uh, which is, you know, is a winter art festival and augmented reality series transforming the public space in Vancouver. So please tell us about SHAPE, tell us like uh, how you know, Shape got involved with Vancouver Mural Festival and all the good things that you're doing there. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, I, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's tough to follow up Colin after he dropped some bars, um, but uh, I'm excited to talk about Mural Fest. It, I, 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 you know, Vancouver is a, a city of so many different types of forces all coming together. And I think the work that Vancouver Mural Fest, the organization has done the last few years is, uh, it's really beautiful. You know, it's it's given opportunities to artists that they might not have had before. Uh, it's given people the opportunity to explore parts of the neighborhoods they hadn't quite walked. And so we really love the organization as somebody that uh, lived in Vancouver for a number of years. Um, it's, it's kind of near and dear to my heart, you know, a place where we put, we put our time after work. And so the opportunity that SHAPE has had to support Vancouver Mural Fest in building out a citywide augmented reality art festival, um, it was automatic for us. You know, we, we jumped at the opportunity. It's, you know, when we talk about our whys and, um, and the things that get us up out of bed in the morning, uh, being able to take the things that we are, um, you know, kind of actioning for global brands on a daily basis to help artists down the street, you know, it's, it's, it's a really beautiful opportunity. So, um, there's 25 different augmented reality murals that are at different spots across Vancouver. The uh, genesis of, of the idea really came from some prior mural activities uh, that were done in AR. And I believe you know that, that Ben and Andrea who run Van Mural Fest, they saw this and they, you know, they loved it. And they said, well, what if, what if we just did a mural fest, but all augmented reality? Um, and so Vancouver gets to be a bit of a star around the world right now. Um, this is one of the biggest augmented reality festivals in the world and in many ways gets to help inspire not just the artists locally, but other cities to invest in the technology and to try to figure it out. And when we look at the time of year, you know, Mural Fest usually happens in the summer. Uh, it's great and I hope that, that everybody gets a chance to walk around. Um, you know, as it grows and matures that there's this opportunity to do it again, you know, let's do it a couple times during the year. And so how do we use our winter months to kind of get people up, especially in a COVID environment? Everyone maybe has been spending more time inside than they ever anticipated doing so. And the Van, you know, the Winter Arts Festival from Van Mural Fest um, really is, it's, it's, it's built in, in this way to get people up and moving. And if we can do that in Vancouver while supporting the arts, you know, we're in a really great environment. I love it. So I'm assuming that there are 25 artists. Is that right? Yeah, there are 25 artists. And one of my favorite aspects of winter, um, you know, the Winter Arts Festival is that these are not your typical mural artists. Mm -hmm. Vancouver is one of the, the world's top VR and AR hubs. There's a lot of 3D skill sets here because we support some of the gaming and, and uh, some of the film companies. You know, we've got EA We've got uh, a lot of the film studios, Hollywood North, they'll call it from time to time. And so we have all these really great artists that are building 3D environments and 3D props and, and designs, but a lot of them are connected into the commercial work and commercial channels. And they don't necessarily always have an opportunity to bring that out into the streets. Mm -hmm. So with augmented reality, we're actually getting a chance to spark new artistic expression 
amongst a lot of our 3D professionals in the city. And so I think that we're actually growing art here too. We're getting people to think about their commercial work in artistic ways. And I'm hoping that this is also another way that we can take um, our traditional artists in town and you know, in, incent them and kind of bring them into some of the new cool technology that's allowing visions to go from 2D into 3D. You know, I, I really love the whole idea of activating public spaces. And I know that, for example, organizations such as the Vancouver Design Nerd and ACMA, they have done a great job of activating our public spaces. But this is like, during the pandemic, a lot of our, our musicians and artists have been affected by, by the pandemic. And just like putting a spotlight on them and having their art seen. And uh, as you're saying, like most of them are in commercial, but you know, just the uh, in a different setting, it's, uh, it's very unique and, you know, getting people out. I know that uh, when Pokemon Go came out, so you got a lot of people that were like out there, you know, just like with their laptops and everything. So it will be interesting to see. It's, uh, um, it's happening February 12th, is that right? So Yeah, it's, Febr it's February 12th to the 28th. And you can go to the App Store and download the Van Mural Fest uh, mobile application. Um, maybe in years, uh, in the future, it'll be it'll be published through Fission, and it is uh, it's a really great app. It helps you uh, understand where all the different murals are around around town, and um, it is going to be a map of where each of the augmented reality murals uh, exist around town. Um, the the really nice thing about augmented reality that we're learning to uh, by helping put on the festival is that you know the art can sit in one part of the city, um, you know? So if, if we really want people to, to get to English Bay, we can create a, a 3D whale and have it swimming on the English Bay beach. Um, but that same whale mural can be something that you experience in your home, whether it's in your backyard or your living room. And so this is giving us an opportunity to really expand the exposure of a lot of the artists' work. So that even if you don't live in East Van or you don't live in Kits, it's, it's uh, not too difficult for you to be able to experience that same art as well. And this opens up new opportunities around accessibility. Not everybody can, can actually, whether it's finding the time or maybe they just actually can't get out to those spaces. Maybe they're stuck at home for a variety of reasons. And so we're giving the artists more, more exposure. And is there, a, is there a place where obviously, you know, you know, in the streets that people can bump into each other and, you know, start a conversation? And where people can people within the app connect with one another and communicate like I haven't downloaded it yet so I'm not sure like you can obviously see. Um, yeah, you can see the art but I'm wondering where is the conversation taking place and how this is going to spark new connections. Right. So uh, the app is uh, really built for wayfinding at the moment. So being able to show you where the different installations are. But mm -hmm. when people are connecting in those locations, now we're starting to stimulate the public square. And so that's one place where we'll start to see people connecting. They'll be outside. It'll be COVID safe. Um, the other place that I, I'm uh, excited about is that you know, augmented reality is, is a technology that we're primarily experiencing through our phones today, right? So what you'll do is um, you'll go to a, a certain part of the city, uh, maybe part of the downtown core, you'll scan a QR code with your phone and the art installation will pop up. You'll be able to see it. If it's animated, it might be the dragon that's running around you. And it's really, really beautiful to see that. But it becomes natural that you're looking at a dragon through your iPhone, that you can now capture it and share it through your social media platforms, whether that be Facebook or Instagram or Snap. And once you do that, now we, you have, you have that, um, that spark for all of your friends to now have that conversation with you about art or to ask you about where that specific dragon was because they want to go and find the dragon hologram themselves. And so I think that that's how we're going to stimulate conversation with this. I love it. And I can't wait to, you know, for uh, different artists to be showcased. I know my friend Tim Rolls has done a piece and uh, my friend Ben Cooper, he's been involved with this as well. He's like, a, so shout out to them and um, curious to see more. And, and I want to know a little bit more about Shape and, you know, your involvement with Shape and uh, what sort of projects do you guys take on? Who are your clients? Mm -hmm. So Shape is, uh, we're having a lot of fun at Shape. Uh, 
we finally have reached that point where augmented and virtual reality uh, is creating business value. You know, for the last decade, there has been this exploration of the technology. Obviously, these things are beautiful. We were kind of limited in not everybody having headsets and, you know, the experience is not necessarily, you know, they were, we were still maturing. Um, and they're very powerful experiences, so it takes longer for the technology to mature. Today, we're seeing, uh, you know, in, in retail, in CPG, that there is a lot of demand for creating experiences, that 2D content got replaced by video content, but now we actually ha have the ability to create all over the place. Those experiences can also be used to drive business value. So, you know, we're just finishing up a project with Coca-Cola in Europe out of Amsterdam. And what we're doing there is helping them take a lot of their drinks and, and create 3D cocktails in augmented reality. Um, we work with some other really great companies like Red Bull. We've worked with the Olympics and um, we're heavily focused on bringing the third dimension into the e-commerce experience. So this is uh, helping companies like Tiffany, for example. Tiffany has a lot of rings. Stores in COVID had to shut down. You know, the business models for retailers have, have really been flipped upside down because they used to drive most of the revenue per square foot in a retail location in brick and mortar. Now you can't really go to the store. They've shut, they've shut down the ones that weren't very, very profitable. And so we need to have that third dimension, being able to experience products, see and feel them online in the browser. And so Shape is really focused on helping retail companies and other organizations use that third dimension online to experience products and brands in a deeper way. I love that. Even I had an experience once where I was at the Hermes store on Alberni and uh, it took a long time. I, I had a question, you know, from a salesperson, you know, to talk about like materials and pricing. And honestly, it took forever for her to get to me. And I was thinking that if they just had an app, if I could just like, you know, you know, augmented reality, and I could just see all the the fabrics, different materials, and the pricing. I don't really need her like to, you know. I just wasted like half an hour there waiting for this person to come, you know. So there's like obviously like right now with COVID you know, it's different, you're, ta you're targeting like online, but I just thought that that was like an interesting use case scenario there, you know, that- it, that That's a perfect example. Um, and we've all had those experiences of going to the store and waiting for somebody to help us, not getting the help that we need. Mm -hmm. I think that we've learned that you can have really great uh, purchasing experiences online, that the speed at which things can arrive at your door uh, really makes it a better experience than having gone to the store but we still need to be able to see a product to feel good about it. One of the magical things that's happening in augmented reality, and I invite all of you to check it out. Certainly we've seen in Snapchat and Instagram, a lot of these face filters and people are able to try on a mask. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of that technology is now cascading down into the other parts of uh, the way that we, that we buy products. And so uh, there's a local Vancouver company we work with called Vessi. Vessi came out with a new shoe. They do great work. It's, it's, uh, these are uh, waterproof shoes, waterproof sneakers. And so what we did is we created a 3D model of this sneaker and you could try it on in Snapchat. And so you point your camera at your foot and you could see their shoes on your foot and you could tap through the colorways. And so in real time, you're able to see what the shoe would look like on you and faster than you could ever ask an associate to go and get the other colorway, to go get the brown or to go get the blue shoe, you're able to tap through that. You're able to create content from that and share it with your loved ones immediately. And so we think, and what we're seeing now is that this 3D and augmented reality movement in retail is driving a lot of business value. It is gonna become the standard for how we launch and share our products with our customers. Exactly, I love that. And there's a, and I'm also seeing a lot of augmented reality when it comes to fashion, because one of the biggest problems that retailers have is that, you know, um, when people send back products because it's not a right fit, maybe this, a, you know, um, maybe the fabric is not right or whatever it is, right? So the right fit and everything, because every brand has, the fit is going to be very different, you know, your, your size. Um, so what I'm seeing like in fashion is that where you can just, yeah, just it, it scans your body and then you can just, you know, where uh, it has like different brands where you can, you know, um, let's say like uh, Club Monaco, like what would that dress would look like on you and everything. So you know for sure that when it comes, it's gonna be a right fit, you know? So that's kind of powerful. And I think it's gonna decrease the, the number of returns, which is, that's one of, the, one of the biggest problems that, you know, online, I, 
I mean, like, correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, with you know, online shopping stores have uh, the returns. You, know, you hit the nail on the head. You know, 3D has the ability to change the speed at which companies design products, the way that they share them with their supply chains and manufacture them. And then all the way to the marketing and e-commerce, you know, we can show people really beautiful uh, product imagery and augmented reality in 3D, and then we can help them buy in a, a much richer way. And then post-purchase, we can kind of teach them about the products in a better way. You know, behind you, you have your couch. I don't know how you went about buying it, but a lot of people have been buying furniture during COVID. And one of the problems that the furniture e-commerce space faces is, is returns. Now, when you return an H&M dress, that is something that um, doesn't take up a lot of space. But mm -hmm. you can imagine that if you double the number of sectional returns, as a furniture company, you're having to go out and rent warehouses that you hadn't planned on before just for your ghost couches to sit. And so furniture is one of the verticals, it's one of the, sorry, the product categories within retail that is benefiting the most from augmented reality. If you're picking your couch, you wanna be able to make sure that it fits into your living room before you actually order it online. Yeah. And so furniture is one of the leading product categories for augmented reality today. Exactly. Um, I have a lot more questions, but I have to open it up to see. I think Melanie had a bunch of questions she was asking. She said, is there a plan for taking this beyond Vancouver in the future? She's referring to the Vancouver Mural Fest. So there are uh, a number of, of mural fests that are kind of popping up around the world. Um, Toronto's just got a chance to play with one. There was one uh, in New York. And so I think that all all major cities are going to have augmented reality mural fests. Um, but in Vancouver, we get a chance to show everybody what's working, what the model is. Uh, and I'm excited to see what happens when the VMF team is asked to go and, and throw you know, an AR festival in Madrid, you know, because I think that that's going to happen next year. My, my big thing is, what does it mean to take AR on tour? I'd love to see the Vancouver artwork in another city that you can only experience in person. So, and the same thing, can we have Madrid artwork come to Vancouver? I pitched this to the Biennale and they, four years ago, and they were like, what are you talking about? I'm like, they should James has poster. got this now. Breaking down those <laughs> well, geographic barriers. Yes. Yeah, so. well, I mean, as, as Boris knows, it's always about timing, right? Um, yeah. And you're absolutely right. We have that opportunity to bring artwork around the world uh, and create international community through the sharing of that artistic expression. Shipping uh, art collections around to uh, exhibits mm -hmm. is extremely expensive and Great. for the planet, while we're trying to protect it and reduce our carbon emissions, it's not a good practice. There's also, you have to get all the insurance people involved and it's, it's, it's quite difficult. Whereas with augmented reality art, we can actually spin it up in the course of a couple days in another city. Um, all that artwork is online already. It's already sitting in Instagram. It's just about making sure that we can allow people in that city to know that they can go and find those pieces. And so, um, yeah, Boris, I really share that vision. I think that we're, we're going to be seeing a lot of other cities, AR festivals, uh, running through our streets. And maybe it starts to happen every couple weeks. Can, you know? can we just um, call them art festivals rather than AR festivals so we can put the focus on the artists? Yeah. We, we can, we can. I, I think that, um, you know, there's, we're, we're at the, the first innings here of introducing the technology to people, but just like e-commerce has become standard for commerce and the way that we buy things, um, AR art is just gonna be art. And you know, that's your dream, James, right? You want AR things. to be so ubiquitous that you don't even need to mention it. It's just, it's just as part of it. It's like, mm -hmm. I'm going to phone you on my telephone. I don't need to mention that I'm using my telephone because I just am. So maybe AR is going to get there. Uh, James, I don't know if you know this or Boris, little connection here. My roommate beside me usually here is my wife, Mallory O'Connor, who is on the board of VMF. So I know Angela very, very well. We've had uh, David Vertesi, of course, has now stepped away after being a, one of the awesome founders of VMF. And he's kind of moved on and his legacy is massive for what they're doing and how they reinvented themselves last year during a pandemic, where usually they would have 150,000 people on Main Street for the main Saturday of their week-long festival. So it's unbelievable work that they're doing and that you're doing also, James, to, uh, to support them. I didn't realize there was that connection today between uh, uh, the, the Winter Art Festival that's going on with BMF, but, but now I do. So I have something to talk to my wife about over lunch and I'll definitely grind her about 
when are you going to Madrid? What's going on? When are they picking the right here? So, uh, <laughs> Real so. quick here, James, a um, year and a half ago, I was at ARVR Summit here in Vancouver. I'm not sure if, if you were there or not, but I was desperately waiting to see when is this coming becoming mainstream. And I look at your website and I quickly look at some of the stuff you guys are showing and I ended up at Say Duck website. Um, it's very fascinating to me how, how much of a gold mine it is to create these, these uh, 3D, not artwork, 3D content for, for a product. Um, are you guys providing that service? Is it easy to do it? Where, if, if I'm as an e-commerce wanting to, to do a 3D model, where do I start? Yeah, so uh, we certainly have, we've got three service arms. We do 3D production, we do augmented reality development, and then we do standard software development in the back that holds all the things together. Uh, so if you had a number of products and you wanted to create models for them, you would reach out to a company like Shape and we would show you the way. Um, is is it an expensive to, process? Uh, so what we're learning about 3D and augmented reality and these 3D models within the product uh, space is that it can be as competitive as photography, commercial photography. And it starts to win out there, right? Trying wow. to do a photo shoot for a sectional uh, in a home can actually end up costing you five to $10,000 per image. And we can actually do it in 3D virtual space for cheaper than that. So there's this tug of war going on now in product imagery between traditional photography and art direction and augmented reality and 3D environments. And so it's becoming quite competitive. Nice. Uh, it's, what it's even amazing. is a real couch picture? <laughs> yeah, well, I'll, I'll right. tell you that that Ikea has actually- How do we know that Mariam's couch is, a, is really there? That could be a backdrop. I was wondering the same thing. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, oh, we there we go. <laughs> For a second, I thought it, it's a background. I thought it was as well. I thought it was a background. That's Can you nice. jump on it? <laughs> definitely jump on it. Yeah, yeah, definitely can. But uh, I would have, um, yeah, I actually bought this during the pandemic. It took like four months to get here. Crazy, so, crazy. Special, special. Not a virtual background. I'm just Love trying it. to prove it. <laughs> there we go. Obviously, okay, so. Um, uh, just putting it out there to, you know, Melanie, Boris, and James, do you guys have an, any ask from our community or anything that you want to announce to our community? Yeah, I just want to re remind people that uh, they can download the Van Mural Fest app um, on the app stores, and that's a great way to find and support Vancouver's artists, as well as the organization. Uh, it's all being put on by the downtown BIA because we want to make sure that people are getting in the streets or continuing to support our local, uh, our local merchants. You know, it's 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 kind of a, on all of our shoulders to help come out of this COVID storm. And so, um, I think that the Van Mural Fest app is a good way to start. So I'm hoping everybody can jump on that. I'm, I'm going to do just a quick call to action to entrepreneurs who think of themselves as local entrepreneurs. Um, all of my team is east of me. Um, and um, anyone could have dialed into this Vancouver event. And so I want to really encourage entrepreneurs to take advantage of that right now during this time. What other events are you attending and what events are you hosting that you reach out to? So we're on the crappiest time zone on the West Coast. I run all of my events at, at uh, 9 a.m. PST so I can hit lunchtime uh, EST and 6 p.m. Central Europe time. Um, so think about that, right? Like, like this is the world that you should be connecting to. And so I really encourage everyone to lean into that even more. Um, you know, we can still meet at a safe distance in a park over coffee or other things like that. We'll have lots of time for local. The big thing that Canada needs to get good at is stop navel gazing and connect to the world. Oh, yes. <laughs> I, I, I love the, before Mel, you jump in here, I, Boris couldn't agree more. I've already started conversations with other startup communities. I've been in contact with Startup Norway, with Startup Sweden. Mm. I know someone now with a uh, startup community in South Africa. And we're going to be doing, just like we've showcased shows, we've done uh, Surrey edition or Calgary edition or Waterloo edition. We're going to be doing, uh, we're going to be doing international ones, which I think, Melanie, you probably have some context oh. in your role. Rolodex, you can probably feed our way to make. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, I uh, quite a few startup ecosystems over here. Um, sure. But yes, seconding what Boris just said, it drives me nuts. The like 7pm PST events. I'm like, I 
who are you like <laughs> who is at that I mean all the west coast people I get that I'm from Vancouver I understand um also please put um that you're in PST when you're inviting people to events and and uh meetings because I don't know what time zone anyone's in so say like hey do you want to meet on Tuesday at 9 a.m PST uh just as a little addition to that as well that's not my ask though can I have another ask <laughs> okay okay so my ask today is um Please go check us out, uh, Volition Advisors, on uh, YouTube. We are growing our YouTube channel, and we're at like 57, and we want to get that 100, because then you can get your own URL. So please go um, and, and subscribe. And we have some really cool content coming up. I interview founders every Tuesday on Instagram called Founder Chats, um, like 30-minute kind of segment around origin story and all the things, and ask them what brings them joy as well. So that's really, really fun. Um, and then we're launching... Um, something called Off Mute with Mel this month, um, which is going to be kind of digging into uh, uh, um, what is it digging like demystifying and deconstructing and deconstructing myriad topics that are kind of uh, within the startup ecosystem or startup lexicon that are uh, complex or complicated or dare I say boring. Um, and we're going to dig into that. So this month it's Women in Inventorship, really interesting, talking about um, the very row late, uh, row lates, low rates of women who are um, getting patents in Canada um, and why that is. And, and so that's actually really interesting. And then we also have our Amplify pitch events um, every month, the last Wednesday of the last Wednesday of the month. That's that's the one, and that's also on YouTube now. So we right. are taking over YouTube. I like to think, and please do check that out. Thank you go. so much. I have um, an ask here too. Whenever. <laughs> oh, go ahead. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Sorry. Um, anybody who knows me, um, you know my story. Last year, I did a networking marathon, and I didn't know what comes out of it. But hundred days later. It was it was amazing. I, I was proud of it. Uh, I want to do it again, this time virtually. I have plans to do it again on Clubhouse now because I'm excited yeah. about the platform. There's a lot of stuff happening. I want to host 100 rooms in 100 days and bring speakers and have a momentum there. I'd love people to join, join the movement come in and participate in conversations. That sounds great. And we know how to find you. Um, so I, I know we went over time by 15 minutes. So if you have to go, uh, feel free to leave. I'm going to host a, you know, a very short, brief you know, uh, sound meditation. So if you're for it, stick around. And um, so, yeah, so just going to give anyone, if anyone needs to, to leave, you want to say goodbye, we can say goodbye to you. So then it's not one of those. I will probably take this opportunity. I need to go get some lunch before I, my next Zoom call. Okay. Uh, thank you so ver very much. Uh, lovely to have some of you that I haven't met before meet video wise. Uh, the LinkedIn connections are already flying fast and furious. So I look forward to doing more in the future. Thank Thanks so much, everyone. Perfect. Thank Bye. you so much. It's nice to meet you. Um, May I ask how long is it going to be, Maya? Five minutes. Perfect. I love it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so great. Okay, so there's, um, so feel free for, you know, you can adjust, it, it works best if you have headphones on, and feel free to turn off your video. Um, and, you know, just relax, find a comfortable seat. And, you know, just follow, I'm going to turn off my video too. So just follow my voice. And uh, just find a comfortable seat. And, um, you know, if you need a blanket, um, go grab a blanket or a pillow that you're going to see um, and have your feet touching the floor if you or if you prefer you're more comfortable uh, crossing your legs in a lotus position is whatever is most comfortable for you and uh, during this uh, sonic meditation you know it's very normal that thoughts are going to come up and uh, just make a note of those thoughts and bring yourself back either to your breath or connect with the music. Um, and I just want to say that, you know, just to start like lowering your gaze and close your eyes, whatever you're comfortable with, and you're in charge of the, the volume here. So if the volume is too loud, you know, lower the volume for yourself. So with that said, uh, you know, just surrender to the sound of the music and uh, allow yourself to go on this journey.
like to invite you to slowly open your eyes and bring your attention to your present moment. I'm, so I'm really curious uh, where everyone traveled to, where you went. So I love to hear, I know if you may, perhaps we don't have time here to share, but I'll be on Instagram. I'd love to hear what memories came up for you. Where did you travel to? Um, what emotions came up? So there are sometimes things that come up that we need in integration and processing those emotions. So I'm here if you know if you want to connect, um, you know, on Instagram and let me know what came up for you, and so that we could do that integration together. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it a lot. Thank I really liked man. it. Reza First time I experienced it. Very yeah. relaxed over there. He's like very relaxed. Good, good. I'm I'm really happy. Um, yeah. So yeah, let me know if you guys went anywhere, you you had any sort of sensation anywhere in your body, anything that came up, uh, we'd love to hear from our audience and connect with me at, uh, at the lucid self on Instagram and share uh, because the integration piece is really key because sometimes things come up and I don't want to just uh, have our audience to just be thinking why that memory came up, you know, so I'm, I'm here to listen if you need me to, to be there for you. And with that, I would like to thank Melanie. Thank you for sticking around and, uh, you know, our, our guest today. Um, Hi, Jan. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Amazing. And Boris and James and our co-hosts, Reza and Colin, for being here. And uh, you can catch us next week, next Tuesday at 12 um, for an hour or sometimes, I don't know, we go longer, I guess. <laughs> this is what we do now. And uh, maybe because you left it up to me. <laughs> Who knows? That's <laughs> close. <laughs> Who knows? But yeah, um, we'd love to see you guys next week. Follow us on YouTube and uh, Instagram. We're, we're everywhere. We're going to be on Clubhouse soon. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> okay, see you next week. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.